Testing. Ah, hello. Turn it off. Turn it on again. Uh, it must be from Microsoft. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Robert Collins here from Canonical, and his talk is loud. It's very, very loud. <laughs> his talk is called Subunit Testing Across Boundaries for Fun and Profit. Hi, oh, thanks for coming along. Um, the goal I've got here is to teach you enough about subunit that you can choose when you might want to use it, how to use it, and you'll know enough to, to do that if you want to. If I find that anyone here comes along, gives me some patches, and helps out in the project later, that's an extra bonus. But you knowing how to use it will just be fantastic. One of the things that I've I guess the, the topic caused a bit of confusion. This isn't really about binding stuff. This is about the boundaries that you need to cross when you are writing stuff to analyze tests, to work with tests. There's a, a general problem that if you have n languages and m different sorts of analysis you want to do of tests, you can either write m language serializers to something like subunit and n tools to analyze stuff based on that protocol, or you can sort of do a cross-product. And there's a lot of cross-product stuff going on at the moment. There's a few things have consolidated around things like TAP and the JUnit XML format, and I'll, I'll get back to those more in the future. But this is really about being able to do stuff across different languages. Um, one of the things that is really, really Im important for me is being able to sort of get the whole thing working really smooth. So I have a fast workflow. When I do a test, I get the error, I get the result, I analyze it, I jump to the source file. And I want to be able to do that in a fast iterative loop. And you can do that really, really nicely within Python, but you can't do it really nicely from C to Python. Whenever I'm writing um, code in one language and my tool chain is in another, that's where it really starts to frustrate me. So, a bunch of the things I've ended up doing with subunit over the last few years have been about this sort of integration. Um, one of the things that I've been doing for a while in this, in this area is small tools. So trying to keep the unit's philosophy of a little tool that does one thing well, and then another one that you can bolt on, and another one that you can bolt on. And it's, we're starting to get somewhere in this. Um, so this is where uh, my PDF output decided it couldn't print out the speaker's notes. Um, so there's going to be a couple of slides of ad hoc here. So this is, this is a little bit of bling to sort of kickstart the whole thing off. This is a, a project called Tribunal, which, um, ah, the author's here. Love open source. And Tribunal is a GUI viewer for Python test results. So it's utterly useless unless you're writing Python. This screenshot, though, is a screenshot of a subunit stream that's been imported into Tribunal by a patch Martin Paul has put forward for this. He's, he's still working on it. It's not in trunk or anything yet. But it can show any language in a GUI um, and just pop it up. You can save it to disk so you can look at that stream at an arbitrary time. You don't need to be running an IDE like Eclipse or Emacs or Vim or anything like that to keep track of the state. I mean, one of the big values to me of IDEs like that is that they do. They keep track of the last make output in a buffer that you can get back to. But if you turn your computer off or you reboot or whatever, it's all gone. You've got to start by running your test suite over again. To give it a bit more context later on, I want to present a model. It's not the only model. This is a model for thinking about what tests do while they run. A whole test suite is composed of a lot of much smaller test fixtures, and each fixture is going to do some work, it's going to figure out whether the thing it's trying to test works or doesn't, and error in, in some way or, or not. So if you imagine that you wanted to be able to keep track of what's going on, you can model it like this. You have a test fixture which has an ID of its own, a unique ID, you can get back to it later. It takes some actions, it starts and it completes, and it can, may have an, it will have an outcome. So it might start error, and then say, I'm done, I've cleaned up. Or it might start, succeed, and then say, I've cleaned up. 
and you've got a reporter object whose responsibility it is, is to show that to the human. Now, in a, a Python environment, that's called a test result. But if you're writing tests in C, that's probably called segfault. Because you've got a much rawer interface, you don't have exception handling. You can't as easily wrap some code to make sure some other code runs and cleans up later. Now, subunit comes in two flavors. It comes as a parser, where it parses a stream. And this is where, where the green box on the right now is subunit parsing that stream and acting as the display to human. Uh, and you can have a bunch of different uh, parsers and filters. We'll talk more about those near the end of the talk. But the other place subunit can live is when subunit, uh, sorry, I described that absolutely the wrong way around. When subunit is the reporter, it outputs a subunit serialized stream. When you then replay it later, subunit takes the place of the test object, but it sends the test actions to your built-in reporter. And now, this is in the Python language that this really makes sense, but the Java unit testing frameworks have a very similar internal model. Um, Ruby's got something similar. NUnit's got something similar. There's a thing called check for C, CPP unit, and they've all got similar models. So you're able to take this very, very top-level model of talking about the thing and map it into a bunch of different languages. So subunit itself, is at the very, very core of it, is a protocol for test activity. So you can see what's going on. That model I just described just maps straight onto a, a byte stream. It's got a couple of key characteristics, and there are, there are two big competitors for it, TAP and the JUnit XML format. One of the first key things is that subunit streams. There's no buffering required. You, in, in an XML format, in the existing XML formats, you have to run every single test. If that takes 20 minutes or two or four hours, you have to complete that entire process before you can output your result object. So if you want incremental results and you want to find out what's passed or failed before the thing completes, you're out of luck. You've got to write some other mechanism other than your main interchange format to do that. The other really significant format around this thing called TAP has a very, very, very lean structure. It's very, very nice in, in some regards, but it's really not suitable if you want to put complex data. Uh, it's great if you're writing Perl or C where you've really got only success or crash. But if you've got exceptions and you have the ability to gather log files, the ability to get working files off disks, uh, if you had some database state when you, when you crash and you can say, here are the tables, here are the open transactions, and analyze those more sensibly, then you want some way of passing that over. And that's where TAP, while it is very, very good for the language it was designed for, doesn't scale out to other languages particularly well. Subunits protocol is human debuggable, but it's not designed to be a plain text format. So it doesn't round trip perfectly if you copy and paste it, you do line ending manglings at them. Now, we've got some work going on in the project to see if we can fix that, but it doesn't really matter because most of the time you're piping this into a, a pipe or into a file on disk or an attachment to an email and solving 8-bit compatibility and traversing stuff around is, it's been done for a long time. Um, it's also reasonably extensible through two mechanisms. There's a tagging mechanism. So you can tag a whole stream and the tags apply to every test that is then output in the rest of the stream. Or you can apply a tag to a single test. And the tags are, I like them as a way of having data that doesn't affect the protocol, but that people want to use in the things the protocol represents. So you can put a tag in to say, I ran this test on the 13th of January on an i386 machine with two gig of RAM, and then you can come back to those tags and do sort of web to aggregation and filtering based on them. The other way it's extensible is that stuff that the parser doesn't know the specification says, and the, the parsers written so far do, ignore. They just pass them straight through if they are part of a filter chain. It comes in on standard in, it goes out on standard out. So if someone revs the protocol or adds their own extension, you get some craft on standard out, but nothing crashes. And I think that's a very nice property. Right. 
So what languages is this available for you right now? <coughs> in C, the Samba project has this thing called libtorture. Um, and libtorture these days outputs subunit. And the Samba project is doing a bit more and a bit more every time I talk to primarily Yelma um, about it. But I believe they're at the point now where they can use most of the subunit filters to do analysis, even if uh, the bulk of the project isn't aware of them. The Czech project, which is a C um, unit test project, it, it's, it's fairly clever. It does a fork before every test. So if a test crashes, the overall test runner doesn't. And it can then, that means it can do stuff before and after each test at a performance cost. But the Czech project, if you set CK output subunit as an environment variable, then it will output subunit. Or you can compile it and in your main runner you can set the, the output type you want. It's in the current release and that's been out for I think six months or more now. The patch was there for a long time before but they, they had forgotten how to release software. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. They had a 35 step process to do a single release and no one had the time to do it. So I said, look, you've had this patch for a while. What's the, what's the delay? Ha! Ah, releasing. I ended up uh, doing a release and automating much of that for the project. Um, C++, the CPP unit has an extensible reporter um, module. So subunit just ships a libcpp unit subunit. Link that in. When you initialize your, your test framework, you tell it what reporters you want. Away you go. Um, I think there's demonstration code for that in the readme. Shell unit. Uh, not the shell unit 2 that Google recently released, but actual shell unit, which has been on SourceForge for about a decade. There's an extension point in that, and I'll hook subunit into that. It's in the subunit distribution. Uh, Pi unit. This is the only primary, like, fully capable parser that I know of for, um, well, there's a small, there's a small pearl one, um, but the sort of most capable one and the one that's had the most work done to it is in the Python world because I primarily work in Python. It's where I reach to as my quick tool for doing high level stuff. Uh, Perl, Yama, is there a Perl emitter? I've been meaning to ask you this. Is there a Perl outputter? There is, okay. So you've got a couple of options then for Perl. You've got tap to subunit. So you can take any Perl test suite that's running tap, output the tap output through tap to subunit, which is a subunit filter, and you'll get subunits out the other side. And then you can throw that into any of the other subunit filters. But there's apparently also a native set of bindings for outputting subunits directly from Perl. Um, and JUnit XML isn't really a language binding here, but it's a filter, subunit to JUnit XML, that takes subunit in and outputs a reasonably bog standard JUnit XML test file. And that's really, really useful for integration. The Drizzle language have um, a questions. Yep, go for it. The end unit probably outputs an XML format, which is either a flavor of or transformable to uh, the J unit XML format. Okay, but let's not go too off the deep end. Um, I'd like to give some time for questions later. And, and so, the Microsoft, what was the, what was the question? Um, so the, the question then is how, if I'm taking a test suite from Microsoft that's in an XML format, how do I get that through into a subunit base stream? I would write a transformer that I'd like, I'd write a small bit of software that parses that XML and outputs a subunit stream. And then you could put that into your pipeline however you want. Yep. So the one that I'm referencing here does the other, other transform. It takes subunit and outputs XML. So if you've got a continuous integration server that wants an XML file on disk, this gives you that. Without you having to have anything in your personal application aware that there's XML involved at all. Um, right, so... A little bit more detail on the design features. I wanted to make this really, really easy for other people to implement and to take and, and run with. So. This part, the stream itself, you don't need to go and look far down the stream to figure out what's going on. It's, it's line-based. You read a line, you process it. You can take two streams, and you can just 
combine them one after another, and you'll get a valid subunit stream. Uh, if one of the streams is incomplete because the test has started but not completed, the parser will error about that at the end of the, the whole lot. It won't suddenly bath and throw an exception out back into your code. You can and uh, you need to run some object level code, so like a semantic analysis, but you can take two streams that are running concurrently and put one test from one and one test from the next and one test from the other and one test in whatever sort of interleaving you want. And that's very, very useful if you're doing parallelization of your test suite. So if you take the current sort of auto test facilities for parallelization, you just get bang, everything on standard out when things go wrong. And subunit is a great way to organize that. One of the things I, I want to do, or to have someone else do for me, please, is to get an auto test to uh, subunit converter, and then we can use that existing good solution for combining these things to, to process that. Um, the pass-through feature is there so that if you have something that the, the parser doesn't recognize, for example, a debugger prompt, you can just have the, the parser sitting on the socket and reading the protocol, forwarding what it sees to your console, and you can actually drop into a debugger session and have that work. Right, if, if, you, have, if you have something that your test suite does that is... Is, is useful to know that it happened uh, and can't be represented in the subunit today for some reason, or you can't modify that code to get it represented in subunit, you'll still be able to see it. So it, it means that you can add subunit in a very graceful way to a, to a system. Um, it reports activity, now, as opposed to reporting the outcomes of things. This means that you can detect the hung test. If you only report that this test succeeded or this test failed at the wire level, then you have no knowledge when something stops talking altogether where it got to. Whereas this way, starting a test is very, very safe. It never, basically never crashes. So you'll see this test started and you won't see it finished. Hey, great. We know, what we're, we know where the thing went wrong. We're in a good position to go and analyze it later, even if it happened on the EC2 or you know, Rackspace or some other out of my immediate reach place. It timestamps, uh, op it's optional, so you don't have to have it there, but you can timestamp, which means you can run performance analysis. This test took 15 milliseconds, this took 15,000 milliseconds, I want to know what's going on. This is very, very easy to do interactively, but it's not so easy to do with something that's been stored to disk and that you're pulling back later, or that's been sort of clustered by going through uh, buffering on sockets and things like that, which is why timestamping in the stream is actually quite important. I talked about tags before. Um, the other sort of designable thing is it's got a, a progress bar concept. It's, it's fairly low key, but it can be useful when you've got a, a bunch of different test suites that you know roughly how big they are, but you don't want to spend a lot of time loading them all off just before you start the output. You can indicate, look, I know I've got a test suite starting, and this one's got 15 members, and I know there's 10 test suites in total, and you can use that to drive a GUI or a progress bar nicely. Unattended testing, doesn't matter who cares. It, it, it's an optional feature again, and it, it can be very, very nice when you, you use it. So, some of the motivations for subunits um, are more than just the ability to talk about stuff between different languages. One of the nice things you can do with it is you can work around bugs in other people's software. You can also work around bugs in your own software. One of the most obvious of these bugs is global state. If you have something in global state and you, I don't know, you've got a, a factory object and the factory object has a bug, you can break your entire test suite by triggering that bug. What you can do with subunit is fork around that test. You get the feedback back to your outer level language. Again, if you've got a part, you could, if you're using this just as a communication protocol, all you need is a parser for that language and you're away laughing and resume, and you're not affected by global state changes. There's a decorator in Python, which uh, the next slide shows you, which does this automatically for every single test. Um, and some examples of where this has been used. Landscape, which is a product Canonical makes for system management, uses this as part of their server-side testing. They have uh, Zope utilities, 
in play, and Zoop Utilities are global state singletons. So they, every now and then, they get in the way. Um, another common one I've seen this useful is Django configuration files. Uh, not, well, not really configuration files. Django's configuration modules are kind of a global state thing. They have to turn up at a particular place, and you have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get rid of them. So again, using this Python decorator, people have said, OK, that's, I don't want to know about that for most of my tests, and it just gets out of their way. Um, if you're doing something like um, testing C from Python, and this, is, this can be a, a, a useful kind of idiom, if you write some small bindings to something, you can throw a lot of inputs at it very, very quickly using Perl or, or Python or Ruby or whatever you like, because you're in a high-level language which does generators and so on. But you may still crash in the middle of calling to that C function, particularly if you're developing the C bindings at the same time. So running those tests in a subprocess again, you'll, something will crash, but it won't affect your whole test suite. You won't invalidate the rest of your results. Um, lastly, Landscape has a client side that runs on the Ubuntu um, desktop, laptop servers as well, and it talks over Dbus. And so the developers there use subunit to set up a isolated Dbus environment that runs the tests and it outputs on its standard out a subunit stream indicating what tests it ran and whether they passed or failed. So this is the decorator I was talking about before. And essentially here it just says we've got normal test suite function, which is an idiom in Python. Actually, I should ask, how many here don't know Python or, or haven't written tests in Python? OK, a fair number. I'll, I'll, I'll take a short segue to describe what's going on here. There's an idiom in Python to get a test suite object, which is a container for a lot of tests. And if you write a method called test suite, things like the trial test runner will pick that up and call it to get back a test suite, rather than introspecting and hoping that they get it right. Um, so this function just says, you know, create a test suite to return from that, add to it from the subunit library the isolated test suite uh, object, and suite 1 through suite n are simply suites that you get from elsewhere by using the existing loader facility, which I, I haven't shown in this example for brevity. Um, one of the things I find, or was finding for a while at least with BZR, was that the test suite was getting too long. It takes 40 minutes to run the Bizarre test suite on my laptop. And we wanted to, we, we are working on making the test suite faster, but you still don't want to be waiting for that long every time you need to run the test suite. So we've added two features to Bizarre using subunit. The first is that it can now output a subunit stream, which means that you can run the Bizarre test suite on another machine elsewhere. Sorry, was that the question? No. Okay. You can run the, the test suite on another machine, stream it back over just over SSH, and, and show it locally. But the more interesting thing is we added in glue to set up a number of parallel test suites running using one test suite per core of the machine you're on, and then that gets folded back into your one process. So combining these two, I wrote a plugin that talks to EC2, starts up EC2 instances, takes the test suite, partitions it. You know, if there are three instances, partition it into three. Each instance runs one third of your test suite, and each instance itself is a multi-core machine with, say, four cores, so you get 12 cores running the test suite all at once. There's a bit of setup time to get the machines warmed up, but you can use them again and again and again once they're warmed up. And that brings the test suite down to about two minutes for me. Um, I have actually shown in, in other talks like this the, that being done live, but I didn't want to risk it in a talk like that, um, a network that gets as much load as the LCA one does. Um, right. So. Coming back to this concept of integration, I was saying before that you don't want to be writing m times n analysis tools. You want to write m serializers and n analysis tools, so m plus n, a much better scaling factor. Um, right now, subunit can give you really good integration with anything that talks J and XML. And that's not really a big advantage in and of itself if you've already got an XML output. So if you're in Java, this doesn't really buy you a lot. If you're in um, Perl or Python or any other languages you already support, it actually does buy you quite a bit. 
because the continuous integration tools that are around are very, very, very nice. They are really good at keeping track of tests, of what ones have been failing in the past, of making sure that every commit has a test run run on it, and of farming that out to machines, to VMs. We can bring up VMware instances or run stuff on EC2. And there's a good dozen or more CI tools around that are open source and, and well supported. Uh, well, EC2 is the Eucalyptus Computing Cloud. Sorry, the, the, the Eucalyptus is the open source implementation of EC2, and it somehow wended its way into my brain. Amazon has a um, cloud computing facility. Sorry? Yeah, the, the EC2 is the Elastic Computing Cloud. It's almost recursive. Um, So Drizzle, as a case point, were talking to me about some BZR stuff one day, and they said, look, come and look at our test server, and they have this Hudson instance, which is this big Java thing, and it can give you a lot of introspection and value information about your tests. And I said, so why aren't you showing your tests there? And they said, well, our test runner doesn't do XML. Now, their test runner was just a Perl, bit of Perl code that for each test, wrote a prelude saying the test name and a square bracket, and when it completed, it either wrote space F-A-I-L space, or it wrote space space OK space space, and then an end square bracket. So really, really bare bones. It took me, I don't know, 15 minutes to get a patch up that did basic subunit for them, and they now run subunit to JNIT XML with that patch, and they get full introspection of their test results, and that's... Um, Drizzle.hudson.org has their, their CI tool if you want to go and look at it. Go on. Okay, Monty, the Drizzle guy. Thank you. Um, there's BuildBot, which is a Python CI tool, and it's got a patch for subunit, but unlike many other CI tools, it's got almost no UI at all for showing anything other than the overall thing succeeded or failed and showed the console output. So it's, it's not very useful, but it works. Okay, so uh, that's not going to end well. Okay, um, because most of the toolchain stuff I've done at the moment is in Python, a lot of these examples are focused in Python, but it should be fairly easy to see how you might do it for Ruby or some other language if you've got the facility to um, reuse its test suite infrastructure. Uh, not subunits test suite infrastructure, that language's infrastructure. This um, Python-M, and then a, a name, says pick up the Python module and run the code in it as though you'd just run that script directly. It's a convenient, convenient way of getting at something that could be installed anywhere on the system. So Python-M subunit.run, please run this test suite. My project.test suite is this, that test suite function I showed you before. And It'll go, it'll run, it'll output. The FROB subunit import test protocol client and suite.run is a long way of spelling the same thing. It's what the internals of that function do, but done directly. And I'm showing it here in case people are running stuff very manually in their Python environments, they're able to just pick this up and, and go with it. In a C environment, with using check, this is the CK subunit I was mentioning before. It's the, an enum that you pass in to your srunner command and it causes it to output subunit. But where I think it gets particularly interesting is the ability to just do stuff through small commands piped together. So if you've got tap-based tests, you run each one through tap to subunit, and you'll get good subunit out. Now the reason you want to run each one through subunit is tap is a format. When a stream stops, it can error out unexpectedly you can't validly just combine stream after stream after stream. You've got to process each one on its own. So you'd want to, you'd probably have a for loop if you're using tap at the moment, and you, inside that for loop you'd want to invoke tap to subunit. Um, this is where we start getting onto all the, the tools that have been written to, to do interesting things. Subunit notify is new in 005. Um, Yelma threw it at me yesterday or the day before. And it throws up a notification bubble on your desktop when the stream completes. So as an example, if you have a test suite that takes half an hour to run 
and you regularly go and do something else, even on the same machine, you pop into email, you go and look at Twitter, this will give you a visual notification when it's completed, even if your console window is minimized. Subunit stats just gives you the statistics for a stream. So 400 tests, 200 were passing, 150 were skipped, and 50 failed. Uh, that's not a test suite I'd want to be working with, by the way. Uh, it also tells you what tags were seen, and you know, if we think of other things to put in there, we'll, we'll put them in there. Subunit to pi unit is terribly named, and I'm probably going to add an alias and eventually deprecate this name, because it's just too sort of misleading. What it does is it shows you what test you ran. It lists, each, lists every single test and its success, and it shows you the backtrace and the status information of tests that failed. So it's, it's actually what you want to do most of the time, even if you're not using Python. And that's why it's misleading, having the word pi unit in there. Terrible. Subunit LS lists the test IDs that a particular stream contains. This is part of my regular workflow for figuring out what's failed, running just those tests, and coming back to it. Um, I'll come back to that later. But subunit LS is... At a command line level, you're sort of key introspection to pick out individual test names. <coughs> um, this is an example of what Drizzle do, basically. They take a stream, they pipe it through subunit to XML. The dash O just says write this XML file when you're done out to this directory. There's another option to subunit to JNT XML, which will forward the entire stream on, on standard out. And this is useful because you can then combine two or more of these filters. You can run subunit through subunit to JNIT XML, output to an XML file, forward the stream onto subunit notify, and get your pop-up window. So you're able to start mixing them together. Right. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you can start building up on, on top of having a, a consistent object model. This is a sample of subunit protocol itself. It's, it's not particularly pretty, um, but it's meant to be able to be looked at by, the, by a human, not adored by a human. Um, key features is that there are two outputs for every test, the test beginning and the test completing. So the first one there is the test, test link tree command or test link tree, and then it failed. The square brackets that you see on the end of the second line and the beginning of the last line are just the boundaries for the sort of opaque data in the middle. Subunit doesn't care what's in there. Um, as long as it doesn't have carriage return, square bracket carriage return, it's fair game. It keeps going. Um, if you timestamp it, then you start adding ISO timestamps into the stream, and you just add them as often as you want. They set the current time for the parser, so it, it, it considers itself a time driver, if you like, and it can jump forward or backwards, because if you're concatenating two streams, or you're combining two streams running on different machines, they may have different times, different clocks, so you reset it before any actions related to one test, and then you switch to another one, reset the time again. Okay, this is, um, this is Python parsing subunit, so very small amount of code needed. I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. Um, essentially, you grab a class from within subunit, you grab a stream, like sys.standard in, you grab a result object. Remember the test and reporter separation I talked about right at the beginning? The result object is your reporter, and that's where you can write your custom code. It's kind of a sax like model. You get called into on your reporter object, and you can do whatever you like there. Um, these are some workflow examples. Self-test run my self-test, subunit filter is able to filter subunit streams. It can kick out passing tests, it can kick out failing tests, it can look at tags, it can look at regex patterns within the assertions. So you can say, I want to ignore everything that's a value error. I know what's going on there, I want to see if there are any other tests that are going to surprise me. Um, the t.log, um, tfail.log there is just keeping a copy around for later. And as I said, subunit to pi and it shows it. It's the, the workhorse. You can loop on that and keep running that until you've got no failures at all. And the way you do that is you read the old log, the old subunit stream through subunit ls to get a list of the test IDs, 
for the failing. And you then run just those tests. So you need your test runner to be able to take in a list of the test names it's been outputting and only run those. Once you've got that, you've got the loop closed and you can start running just the failing tests, which is a, I think it's a very nice way to work. And I'm going backwards. That's not the evolution I was looking for. This is kind of a really terrible slide, and I'm sorry to have inflicted on you. But in terms of being able to analyze stuff, the third line there, subunit ls dash dash times from the log you have, sort dash n dash k2 through head and however many you want to look at, and then you get back your test IDs and how long they took with the slowest ones at the top. So if you've got a slow test suite and you're not sure where it's slow, very, very, very simple way of getting that out. And um, that's, you know, the thing that I really like is that I can do that with any language without having to reinvent this. Um, those numbers are in seconds, and those tests are, well, no, don't confuse me. Um, the point is to show different numbers, not to show actually long tests, because I don't like those. Oh, this, uh, in my Twitter feed, is a URL linking to this talk. So if you're taking notes based on what's up on the screen, you can just grab it off Google Docs later. You don't need to sign in or anything. Um, aggregating stuff. So once you've got these streams, and I've talked about how you can concatenate or, or interlink them, you probably want to be able to sort them out later. So tagging, really, really useful. Um, the tags command there is one that I use to tag stuff on an architecture and a date. But you know, it's freeform. Do whatever you like. Um, Smolder is kind of like a CI tool, except it doesn't run any tests. It's a Perl thing that takes tap in and shows tap results later. Something I'd like to see written for subunit is a, an equivalent system. Uh, you could, in principle, write a subunit to tap, but you'd have to discard a lot of data. Um, I mentioned Tribunal earlier, and I started over my holidays recently a project called Test Repository, which takes this sort of very manual workflow I've described earlier with sort of long command lines to do the same thing and, and to iterate on it. And it's a little database that stores a subunit stream on disk and it knows which tests failed, and it knows what you want to do is you want to keep unioning them together and get back out the IDs. So it's, it's just automation around this workflow. And this is an example of test repository. I, I run my tests. Uh, I've got a make file that has the right glue, just subunit output uh, through test R load. Tells me how many tests there were and the ID of the stream it added. But I want to see some failing tests, so I wrote some earlier. I unshelve them. I run it again. I get a full trace back. There's not enough room here without multiple slides to really show it. But I get the full trace back for just the failures. And it tells me the summary. But that's not really remarkable. What's remarkable is I can now go test our failing, and it comes back and shows me those trace backs and the failing tests again without having to run the tests in a repeated loop. Yes. Pipe fail. Set pipe fail. Is it? I've seen posit stuff for this as well. Okay. So is that one or zero? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. Well, we're, we are on to question time because the next slide was questions. Um, the question Tridge raises is what about pipelines? Um, if you've got errors, sig faults, Python blowing its guts out, anything goes on in the middle of a pipeline, later entries in the pipe don't see the problem. And there are two things. The first thing is that if something interrupts, so the first thing is you should set pipe fail or the equivalent for your POSIX pipe on. Yep. Um, the second thing is that, generally speaking, things don't blow out at the beginning of a test. They blow out in the test code itself. You, usually enough for the framework to get up and going is OK. Well, I think at that point you're going to notice anyway. Well, on the build farm, you'll see zero tests rather than 4,000, and that's going to be a very big red flag. Yeah. 
So um, a more insidious error is when you see 3,850 and you don't know where the other 150 went. And, and while well, subunit should be able to be helping you with that reasonably well, because anything that's cut off halfway through a test, subunit will report an error on. Um, I, would, I would like to see if there are other questions here and to actually debug that with you during this week. Are there any other questions? Is the sky blue? Yeah, oh, great. Oh, yeah. Is it multi platform? I don't know whether you said that or not. Is it? Does it work Windows OS X? Uh, is it cross platform? Yeah. Yes. It's, um, so Drizzle. Does Drizzle have a Windows build, Monty? Okay, I don't know about Windows, but it's an active use on Solaris, Mac, um, Mac OS X, Linux. Uh, I'm not aware of any platform-specific code that should prevent it working on Windows. And I'd be, if someone wants to give me remote access to a Windows machine, I can help fix it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll take any patch with no questions asked that fixes stuff for Windows. Because I don't know what questions to ask. Uh, I recall about nine months a year ago, there was some discussion in the Pell community on um, an improved TAP protocol. Is there any relationship between that work, which I, to be honest, perfectly honest, didn't pay a lot of attention to, and this work? Um, well, Subunit, Subunit was created, uh, I don't know, about five years ago on a CoCom where Conrad Parker and I sat down and said, you know what would be really nice? To solve some of these isolation problems, and we we came up with this protocol, which has evolved very cautiously since then. Um, I've spoken to some Perl people about the improved tap and the things they're doing, but I think the retrofitting stuff onto it, it, it's not really a good fit. The basis under which you write a tap parser and, and how you associate what's going on to the actual error that occurs is much much less structured, which means it's much harder to process in a machine manner. It's really made to be read by a human looking straight at it. Um, certainly that I haven't been, I haven't said you should do it this way to them, but every now and then we, yeah. Is that a question? No? Questions, I need questions. I need the exercise. Um, so you've shown uh, a subunit output and stuff you can do with subunit output and, and the, some of the test repository stuff. Um, what other work is going on? In, well, it seems to me that it's mostly useful if as many testing tools as possible can output subunit output. Uh, is there any work going on in that way other than the work I just did? Um, so James DeMay is writing a Java serializer at the moment. Right now, okay. It, but will it be released in the next 30 seconds? And um, he's mentioned adding to Bamboo, his company's CI tool subunit, because it gives incremental, this is what's going on, rather than at the end results. So I think if that works, then it, it really raises a, a good position to start talking to a lot of IDEs, and a lot of IDEs are written in Java probably because they need the support to write in the language. Um, the ability to read from subunit directly rather than XML. So that said, I'm actually very comfortable with the idea of using subunit to get accurate reporting of where things break and incremental progress notifications and UI notifications and to end up writing XML because it's not a bad lingua franca for once you've successfully run the test. It's just terrible for while you're running the tests. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like you're about done. Now, Robert, on behalf of LCA, everybody here, thank you so much for presenting your talk, giving us that information. Thanks a lot. Now, it's afternoon tea time, I understand. Go and stretch your legs. Well, except for you. Go and get some fresh air, everybody.